Ladies and gentlemen, DBNA Television is proud to bring you Aurora Media Production, the nation's number one digital coaches show. If you do not know him, you better Google him. He was a high school Hall of Famer, school record holder, 10-time letter winner. He was just a boy with a ball and a young man with visions of greatness from the land of Hoosiers. When his playing days were over, he wanted to give back to the game that provided him purpose. He had found his passion on the hardwood. 14 years college coaching, multiple regional and conference championships, multiple national rank programs, coached the National Player of the Year. Winning followed him to 15 seasons professional coaching, multiple championships, multiple Coach of the Year honors, near 780 win percentage. He placed over 100 players to their respected national teams that represented their countries at the World Championships and Olympic Games. He has coached current and former NBA NBA stars. His purpose is now to serve, empower, inspire. Here he is, host of the Coach Scott Field Show. Make some noise, show some love. Host Scott Field. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. No matter where you're watching us from around the globe today, I say thank you for allowing us into your homes and most importantly, into your hearts. If you're watching us on the DBNA television network, a sincere thank you for your support. Continue to support our sponsors, support the network, and continue to support this outstanding talent. If you're listening to us in podcast form, I say crank that knob up and let us put that flavor in your ear. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, we're going to use the hashtag, frankly speaking. Like this, send in your comments, send in your questions, but most importantly, Share this content so others can enjoy this quality entertainment. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to lace them up for another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. Extremely thrilled, honored, and excited to have our guest on with us today. People in my circles will not need the introduction of this legendary, iconic man. 1984 NBA Coach of the Year. 1984 NBA Executive of the Year. He was also the J. Walter Kennedy Citizenship Award winner. His name, Layden, is risen to the top of Vivid Smart Home Arena for helping bring these jazz here to, uh, to Salt Lake and, and Utah. He is the husband to Barbara. He is the father to Scott, Katie, and Michael. And Michael, thank you for helping set this up. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Coach Frank Layden. Coach, how are you this morning, buddy? Uh, Scott, good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> Great job there. I like that background there. Yeah. Oh, I, wonderful. I try to do a little something nice here, but hey, to have you with us is just an honor and a privilege. So thank you for your time today to come and, and, sh and share stories with our with our viewers and followers. Uh, New York background there. My goodness, I can't believe that. Yeah, right in your own home, huh? <laughs> there you go. Coach, how you, how's Barbara doing? How's everybody? You know, we're, we're doing very well, Scott. Uh, you know, we're blessed. Uh, we, we've, got, we've avoided getting sick during this pandemic. Uh, we have our shots. Uh, we, we, uh, our family is good. Our friends have been good. So, uh, you know, well, life has been good. What can I say? There you go. Well, thrilled to have you, buddy. It's great to see you. And hopefully when things calm down here in the very near future, we can go uh, share us another lunch together sometime soon. By all means, I'll prove there is such a thing as a free lunch. Okay, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> all right, buddy. I love it. Well, listen, let's get right into it and let's just tell some stories. Uh, we've had great guests on here just recently, Coach. I mean, we had Rick Barry and Spencer Haywood. Uh, Mark Eaton came on with us and, and the big dog, Antoine Carr, and had oh. so much fun telling stories. Yeah, all friends of mine, by the way. Yes. Rick That's Barry. The greatest foul shooter probably there ever was, and a real knowledgeable guy about the game of basketball, right from, from the high school ranks up to the pros. He always was a great player, great coach, great teacher, and uh, a great, great free throw shooter using the old underhand method of shooting. Yep. The old bucket shot. That's right. That's it was, right. Of course, uh, you mentioned uh, one of my favorites there is Mark Eaton. What That's a great right. guy. He's a great citizen. Uh, 
a hard worker. You know, uh, uh, when we drafted him, a lot of people laughed at us, but it turned out he became an all-star, one of the league's great all-time uh, shot blockers and outlet passes. He was a great guy in, in, in the early days of, of the Jazz, yes. Oh, well, he, he spoke so highly of you, and we told great stories, and I want to get in those, but I'd be remiss real quick. I've got a buddy out in New York who's a comedian, who's a big jazz fan, and his name's J.L. Common, and I wanted you to uh, you give him a little happy birthday shout-out to J.L. J.L., God bless him. Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> hey. You know what I mean? You know, they, they start getting closer and closer as you go on in life. But good <laughs> luck. Happen uh, uh, to travel through Brooklyn. Just keep it a secret that we know each other. <laughs> I love it. Good old JL. He's an outstanding comedian who's really blown up and super happy well, for him. And big jazz fan. He's a huge jazz fan out there. Well, a lot of comedians are jazz fans. <laughs> uh, a lot of jazz fans are comedians. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, Coach, you are recognized as one of the best luncheon speakers ever and just one of the greatest sports personalities ever. And so to have you come on the show today to sit here and chop it up a little bit, let's allow you to do just what you do. Let's tell stories. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting to say that because when I started out, uh, I, I, I never intended to be a coach. Uh, my high school coach and my college, I was very fortunate to have Mr. Drucker in high school was a terrific man. Mr. Gallagher in, in college was a terrific uh, man as well as they were both great coaches. Uh, one, of course, I grew up in Brooklyn and, and was the coach of my high school, Fort Hamilton High School, but JL might have heard of. And then, of course, uh, I went to Niagara University where I played with a, for a fellow by the name of uh, John Taps Gallagher. And, and really, it's been remiss that he's not in the Hall of Fame because he was an innovator. He was a great coach. Uh, he never made a lot of money, but he loved doing what he was doing. And he had a great impact on a lot of young men. And both of them said, someday you're going to coach. I said, no way. I see what you guys go through. And it's a tough racket. And it's hard. But I was in the service. And I got a call one day from, from Mr. Gallagher, Taps Gallagher, my coach, Coach Gallagher. And he said, uh, hey, uh, when, when, when are you getting out of the service? I said, well, I'll be getting out around next September. He said, well, I think I got a job for you. I said, well, I need a job. You know, I was married. I didn't, I didn't, I was looking to go into business somehow, maybe sales or something. And he said, uh, it's a coaching job. I said, coaching? I don't want to go into coaching. He says, well, it's, a, it's something you can think about. You can try it, see how you like it. So I said, what am I, where am I going? He said, in high school. I said, oh, my gosh, how do you do that? So you got to teach class and what have you. But anyway, make a long story short, I went for the interview. Interview. I got the job. I had to go back to school, do some more work to get my credentials in New York State. But I started teaching high school history, five classes a day, homeroom duty, bus duty, lunchroom duty, all the things teachers do. And then, of course, after school to coach. And, and I thought I was... I thought I knew everything there was to know about basketball, but they started me at the lowest level. I was in the junior high. I was the, I was the freshman coach at this school and I was working with the youngest kids. And, you know, over just immediately I realized, I said, this is where I should be. Coach Gallagher and coach Drucker were right. You know, I said, this beats working. And, <laughs> you know, I, I started out with that 10 years in high school. 10 years of coaching in college, and then, of course, 13, 14 years in the pros. Wow. Was, I saw a lot of great people. I met a lot of great people. And, and, and some of it went back to my, my college days. I was fortunate enough, Scott, to, to have a roommate and a, and a, 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 a classmate. And then a, 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 we played baseball together. We played basketball together. There was a fellow by the name of Yubi Brown, who you probably heard of it. Yubi, of course, was a was a great announcer now, but he was a wonderful basketball coach, uh, you know, and, and a Hall of Famer, by the way. That's how good he was. And he coached in high school and college. And and he told me I was I was coaching at Niagara, our alma mater, and he said, go in the pros. That's where it's going to be in the future. 
And, and of course, they had the ABA and you had the NBA. He said, they're going to merge. He says, we're going to make a lot of money. You don't have to recruit. Uh, and uh, he said, I think you'd like it. And, and sure enough, he took me on as his assistant. And, and I went to Atlanta with him as his assistant. We worked for the great Ted Turner. And the rest is history. Yeah, I see, we, I, I love that story. Well, I like tell youngsters when I go around and speak, you know, I say, listen, it's important to study. It's important to work hard. It's important to be good at what you do. But it's even more important to have a great roommate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and, you know, talking, you. About, talking about Coach Hubie Brown, I mean, his when he's a broadcaster, I mean, yeah, he was coach of the year when he came back and took that Memphis Grizzlies team. But his insight and his knowledge and acumen that he shares – while broadcasting puts him at an elite and just to be around a guy like that coach had to be phenomenal for you. Well, he's a, he's a great clinician. And you know, it's funny when we went to school together, that's all we did. We, we both loved baseball. We both played for the college team. He was a catcher and I played first base and we had another great player, a great professional player it was a, a, a guy by the name of Larry Costello who oh. coached the Bucks. And, and at one time, this is a little school, Niagara University, only had 2,000 students. Uh, we had three guys, Larry Costello, Yubi Brown, and Frank Layden, coaching in the NBA at the same time. Wow. We all, and we played together at Niagara and, uh, and both baseball and basketball. In fact, Larry was a better, and so was Yubi, and I think I was too. We were all better at baseball than we were at basketball. So oh. Larry became a very, very good professional player. And, and, a, and a very good coach. He won the championship uh, with the Milwaukee Bucks. With, uh, he had, uh, you know, Oscar Robinson and, and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at the time, you know, uh, Lou Alcindor, and they won Lou the Alcindor, that's right, the Skyhook. <laughs> uh, wow. We, uh, we, had a, we had a good time, but, you know, going back to you mentioned about speaking. Well, when I was coaching in high school, I didn't make any money. It's funny, when you need the money, you don't make it. You know, and that's when I needed it. When I was coaching I took two summer jobs and I'd be working at night and doing all sorts of things to, to keep my head above water. But anyway, we, we, man, we always had a house. We always had an old car. We, always, you know, we banged along. And the important thing was being happy. But one a thing, you know, that I made money doing was speaking. I went out. Someone, someone said to me in, in, uh, from my church. Uh, I, I was a Catholic and I used to be in the CYO with the kids and stuff. And they asked me to come and speak at, at church breakfasts and uh, communion breakfasts and all these, all these uh, events in the church. And they'd say, Hey, uh, would, would you be our speaker? And I started to speak. And I started to kid around, uh, kid, kid, some of the people in the audience and what have you same jokes. I'd always be stealing jokes wherever I could, but you know, I started to make pretty funny doing that. Well, later on, when I got into the pros in college, too, with college, I had to do a lot of re recruiting, so I'd have to speak at school. I'd recruit some kid, get him, come to our school, and they'd say, oh, you have to come and speak at our banquet, you know, awards banquet at the end of the year. Uh, those were free, but uh, the other times, you know, I found out I could make pretty good money speaking and making appearances, and then I got, in, I got an agent, and I actually started to do motivational speaking for companies and, and even got into doing a couple of movies. Uh, you know, I, I got a screen, I'm a, a, a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And, and I found out that, that there's good money at other people listening to you talk, some, some better than others. But, but uh, you know, I, I worked at it. And I, like I said, I used to steal a lot of material. And, uh, and you know, I'd, I'd see people and, and, and uh, do a little skit, you know, a little act, a, a act that I could do putting it for baseball, football, basketball, whatever it happened to be. And I uh, had a lot of fun doing it, but made a lot of money. In fact, Scott, in 1984, the following year that I was coach of the year, and I got a lot of publicity internationally because of that, I gave over 100 talks. And that wow. 100 talks, that's 100 days. You have to travel someplace. You have to travel back. It was a lot of work, but it was, it was very profitable. And I got the chance to actually go to Italy, uh, go to London. Uh, I mean, uh, go all over the United States speaking. And, and it turned out that <laughs> people started, knew more about me speaking than they did about coaching. They, did, they weren't 
impress with my coaching, but they <laughs> like speaking. So, but I did it. Worked out fine. Oh, uh, it's been just phenomenal. I, I just, every time I'm around you, I just, I feel so uplifted and, and enjoy the storytelling. So to, again, to be doing this with you today is just a lot of fun. Give us a Hubie Brown story back in the days when you guys were probably driving the old beat up clunkers and going to a gym to do a camp or something or doing a clinic. Give us an old Hubie Brown story that a lot of people wouldn't hey, know. One thing about, about Hubie Brown, all right? When you see him and, and broadcast uh, or, you know, be, be, be a, a commentator on uh, television, one thing about it was, and I learned this from him too, very important in coaching. When I was coaching in high school, I used to wing it. You know, I went day in, day out. How oh, we have to do this, we have to do that, you know. Well, I found out that when you got to the pros and you had so many games, you had to be organized. And he, he taught me uh, that that lesson was how to organize, prepare for practice. And then it became important not only to prepare for practice, but prepare for life. And I went around more recently giving talks to people that were preparing to retire and saying, have a, have a game plan, you know, be prepared. Don't, don't just go off into, Hey, I'm quitting. I'm going to be, you can't play golf every day. You know, you can't live, live in, in Hawaii all the time, you know? So what happens is uh, I prepared this. So the greatest thing I learned from you, and I, I really mean this, was to be prepared. And you can see that when he broadcasts the game. The difference between him and a lot of the, of the other people, especially the celebrities who do the color part of the broadcasting, a lot of great, guy, great guys do play-by-play. -play. They're professional. But the guys, ex-players and ex-coaches who do the color stuff, they're not prepared. If you listen to Yubi, he not only knows the game, but he knows the personnel. He studies. He works at it. And, and it's, I mean, even now, after listening to him for 20 years, I think back of when I started with him, we'd be on the airplane, he'd have the book out, do this, do that. This is what this guy did. This is what Jack Ramsey does. You got to watch Jack Ramsey. He'll do this. Somebody else oppressed you. Somebody else, yeah, was, was he taught me about being prepared for not only for basketball, but being prepared for life, being ready to, to, to be in the next stage. What have you fired? You know, it's devastating to some coaches. We were in a position, I used to say, if I ever get fired, I'll get a better job. I'll be a good salesman. I can be on TV, radio, whatever it might be. Study, be ready. And, and in fact, make it part of your life to have fun. That's very important. And I can remember uh, us talking about that too. One thing about UB, we were laughing all the time at ourselves, but we also were laughing at other people because we were having fun at the job we had. And this is the truth. It never was about money. The money just came. When I coached in high school, I didn't have much, but we had a car, we had a house. We, had, we were able to send the kids to camp. We got to college, all right? We had a little bigger house, a little bigger car, country club, stuff like that. And then we got to the pros. The real kicker was everybody was treating us. It was amazing. I was getting free meals, free food, free clothes. <laughs> I used to say, I don't need it now. I need it in high school. <laughs> but the way life is. And, and, uh, but, but the greatest thing of all, Scott, and you, you are right in there with all the people. The greatest reward we ever had, the greatest, the greatest thing ever, ever came back to me, besides being able to help youngsters get on with their lives, be better husbands, be better fathers, be better businessmen, be better soldiers, whatever it might be, all right? It was very important, all right, to, to, to say that you got to have fun. Your job has got to be fun. Mother Teresa tells us, if your job isn't fun, you're a slave. And I, oh. I really believe that. You know, my father, he worked on the docks, you know. He was, he was second generation from Ireland, and he was a longshoreman. You know, he came, in, came to this country, and every day he went to work saying, ah, I got to go to this job. I hate this job. You know, he used to say, oh, thank goodness it's Saturday because he worked half a day on Saturday even. And I used to say, thank God it's Monday. I love to go to work. I there you go. Yeah. I and, love that. And yeah. Once a coach, always a coach. Again, hashtag, frankly speaking, we got legendary coach Frank Layden on here with me today, and he's sharing some great nuggets. Coach, I, I love 
I, I just love your passion. And I've, I've learned so much from you. I still have a book that you gave me when I was the head coach of the Utah Eagles right here. And you came and gave me that book. And again, it was all about preparation and scouting reports. And uh, I've always picked your brain because you've always got a wealth of knowledge and I've always enjoyed your delivery. But uh, it's just just you're always coaching and you're always helping people. You got that servant heart. And that's what I admire about you. Well, you know, you, the, the best part, and I, I started to think about this uh, before, but then I got, I got off track, but the important thing is, is relationships. Oh. It's to know who you meet, you know, some good, some bad. You know, uh, I'll tell you one thing, uh, since I've been retired, yeah, I sit around a little bit more. I, I do a lot of reading. I'm catching up on reading that I, I missed uh, years ago, though I've always been an avid reader. I continue my education. Barbara and I have gone into studying the theater. We've even gone to London, to the University of London, and, and studied theater, critical theater there, uh, not being actors or actresses, but, but, but uh, you know, being able to say what's good theater and what's bad theater, what have you. Just have fun with it and seeing theater all over the, the United States as well as Europe and what have you and, and thing. But the, the best thing I've seen is and I look out at, say, say what's going on in our country today is, is to separate those people who say, I want to serve, and I'll, I'll talk about serving. And they'll say how important it is. And it is. It's important to be a senator. It's important to be a congressman. All right. It's very important to be a teacher because now you're talking about in, in, in harvesting our future with our youngsters. You know, how important is that? What you put into their heads they will carry for the rest of their lives because you're the mentor, you're the teacher. What an important job. But the one thing that, that scares me to death is this selfishness. Oh. Now, that people are, are more concerned about themselves than helping one another. Haven't we gotten over it yet? I mean, we've had wars and civil wars and unrest and everything else, and we're still afraid of the minorities, huh? We're afraid of those people. And, and, and frankly, you know, I've been able to sit back and, and think about these things and saying how, how lucky I've been to meet some of the giants, not, not, not only just in, in the world of sports, but in, in the world of theater, in the world of politics and, you know, and, and how people are, are not, you know, we, we, we were in locker room with time and gee, President Clinton calls up, you know, and, and, and wishes us luck and stuff in the playoffs. You know, it's it's we've we've been blessed that way, but I have been able to weed through and look through and evaluate people for what they are worth and, who, and what they are doing. And if we're not helping others, then what else is there? There's nothing else to do. So I urge people that you know, if you're coaching, you're teaching, you know, we all have some talent in some area that we have something to give. Pass it on to others and Amen. be blessed. The idea that you, you're going to get something back for it. Everything I do for someone else, it comes back two and threefold for me. But like I say, since I've been able to sit back and become an observer, uh, a, a critic of, of society, I'm just appalled by the greed out there. The, you know, this wonderful country where we get so much given to us, and yet we're afraid to share it. And, you know, when I see, hear about it, it breaks my heart when I see, you know, people along the borders just trying to crawl into this country. Well, that was my grandparents at one time coming across from Ireland during the potato famines and stuff, you know, and people struggling and fighting. And, you know, and I've, I've lived through an interesting part of my life, you know, a depression, a great depression, World War II, you know, it just goes on and on, the Korea War, the Vietnam War. You know, and, and, and see that so much sorrow and hurt and what have you. On the other hand, I, I, was, I was president uh, uh, for Jackie Robinson's first game. I lived in Brooklyn and I was, uh, I was in high school at the time. And I cut school. Proud to admit that I did that. <laughs> Went to Ebbets Field, all right, slapped down my 55 cents with my, with my uh, uh, card from high school. I went in and saw Jackie Robinson break the color barrier and play, you know. And I was there wow. with Lou, Lou Gehrig's uh, record in baseball. You know, we were, Scott got us some tickets. My, my Scott, Scott Layton, uh, who was a coach. And uh, we, we went to see, uh, uh, see uh, Ripken break the record. I mean, you know, so I've, I've, I've had great excitement 
you know, Final Fours, you know, great games. I mean, we saw Bill Walton in that great series at the UCLA and, and you know, got to know people like uh, Dean Smith and, and Johnny Wooden and the great high school coach Morgan Wooden and, and coaches like, uh, like, like you, uh, like you, Scott. Oh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to even be oh, put in Scott the field. I never knew anybody had more passion for basketball than you did. <laughs> hey, just to be put in the same sentence as those guys, I am extremely honored and humbled. Thank you, coach. Well, you know what? A good coach is one that wins when has good players. I think you'd be as good a coach as anybody that ever lived. I mean, because nobody has a better work ethic or, is oh. more, or, or more credible. But the big thing is that coaching is, is, a, is a teaching device. And it's not just winning. You know, some of the best coaches I've known were guys who were coaching in high school, coaching in the WNBA, coaching women, and, and were able to, to make an impact on, the, on their students, on their, right. on, on their players that, that is life lasting. And that's more important than all the rest. There's only so many trophies every year. That can That's, be given out. Coach, you're so right. And to, to, to think about how, you know, the best coaches are always the best teachers and best communicators, and they get to know their people and put them in a situation to be successful. And that's what I always focused on. But um, to see the things that you've done and the things that you've accomplished, I'm just, I'm just always in awe, you know, being around you and, uh, you know, sharing, you know, words of wisdom and I love these nuggets that you're sharing with our viewers today. And it's just so amazing. If you, if you go out and if you, if the players believe that you love them, if the players believe that, and this is your own children do, uh, if they believe that you love them and what you're, you're asking them to do is going to make them better. And it's not you that's always profiting. All right. Of course you're going to, if they win, that's fine. You know, like I say, some of the best teams I've had haven't been, had the best people on them, weren't always the championship teams. The thing is that you do, if the players believe that you're interested in them and you're doing things for their interest and, and you're, you're interested in their lives after basketball's over, you were talking about Mark Eaton and, you know, we had Daryl Bailey who lives locally and oh. I get to see them from time to time. Special people that go on and serve after they're finished playing in the professional ranks, still continue giving back to the community. That is what's very satisfying. That's a winner. That's right. Th those who can give back to the community, serve their community, provide mentorship and leadership and guidance for others. Coach, that's, that's, that's the badge. And there's no price tag you can put on that. You know, athletes too have that gift. I mean, look at the industry uses athletes to sell their products, you know? So when Michael Jordan says something, People listen. LeBron James says something. People listen. So you know a lot of these a lot of these athletes are starting to step up now. And whether it's racial injustice or whatever it might be, voting rights or what have you, uh, people are going to listen to them and they're going to follow them because they are special individuals. They're gifted individuals. So true. So true. And you know you you mentioned before talking about having fun. And nobody had more fun than Coach Layden. Uh, my dad back in uh, Indiana, he loves to hear you tell a story about Morgana, the kissing bandit. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I I had heard of Morgana because I saw her at baseball games. Yeah. I think she, she, she ran out and kissed what was his name? Uh, 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 Monday, uh, the guy used to play with the, with the Dodgers. I can't think of his name now. Uh, I think it was Monday. What, what the heck was it? But anyway, I saw her run out on a baseball field and kiss a couple of baseball players. Well, anyway, in that, that particular day, she was in town to be at, uh, I, I think they were a yacht show or something next door to the Salt Palace. They had a big reviewing place and they were selling yachts and she was hired to go there. Well, anyway, you know, that night the game was on and, you know, I was, we had called a timeout or what have you. And I look up and I hear the crowd roaring. You know, I look and here I see her coming, running at me, running right. And, and I figure she's going to run up and she's going to kiss Carl Malone or something, you know, or John Stockton. So she runs right by them. She grabs me. She says, do you mind if I kiss you? So I said, if you don't, I'm going to smack you. So she, <laughs> <laughs> so she kissed me. 
And uh, that's when I, 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 I fainted. I fell on the floor. And it became, <laughs> it became the play of the day on ESPN. Uh, <laughs> it was, it, and you know, it's funny is, you know, I had great uh, runs against the Lakers and with rivalries with Pat Riley and all this, all these great games and every Madison Square Garden and the, and the Forum and, and uh, LA and everything else. But that's what I was remembered for. <laughs> kissing Morgan falling on the floor. So you never know when that moment arises and, and, and greatness is going to be before you. You know, it's you. Like I, she still sends me Christmas cards. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, she she said one time she was on some some show, you know, uh, at night, one of those late night shows, and they asked her, "Who's your favorite guy you ever kissed?" She says, "I never heard of him." She said, "They got me out of this show and brought me over to the basketball game." She said, "I swear I never heard of Frank Layden." She said, "But they sent me in to kiss him." She said, and he reacted wonderfully, you know. <laughs> she said, "You kissed," and then he fell on the floor, and we got both got a lot of publicity out of it. <laughs> And she said, up to that moment, I had never heard of him before. But anyway, oh. Monday was the guy who was thinking of the Dodgers outfit that she kissed. Yeah. Oh, coach, that's just great. Uh, you know, talking about rivalries and talking about NBA competition and it's just drama. And, you know, it, people are so excited about it. I mean, talk about the times where, you know, you're coaching against Larry Bird and Larry Bird is just going to town. And there, there's there's the story that he looked over at you like, hey, coach, can you got anybody over there who can guard me? Kind of share those kind of stories. Yeah, well, you know, it was funny. It You think about opportunity. And that's what I try to convince the people, you know, is, uh, you know, let's uh, say say you're playing in, in, uh, in the Boston Gardens and the players get in there. And I could see during the shoot arounds. The players are looking up at the ceiling and they're looking at all those retired shirts and all those famous championships and everything else, you know. And so anyway, I, you, you try to you try to do the best you can. Now, I remember one time that I called time out and I said, look, I said, let's let the, you know, uh, we were we were losing like uh, 19 to, to six. And the game was only like four minutes, uh, four minutes into the game. And so I, I called time out. And the players, I could see the players were scared to death. So I said, look, I said, look up at the, look up at the ceiling. I said, you see all those championship trophies, all those championship flags. You see all those names that are retired up there. I said, look up in the stands. Who's sitting up there smoking a cigar? All right. During the game, he's smoking a cigar. The great Red Auerbach. I said, this is a great team. I look over there and I see Larry Bird and I see Danny Ainge and all these great players on the Celtics. I said, I know they're much better than us. I said, but my goodness, I don't think we can beat the Celtics, but we should be able to beat Larry Bird. I said, but right now he's ahead of us 14 to two. And the, the team was laughing. They were going out onto the floor and they were all looking at each other and they were slapping hands and laughing and everything else. And Larry Bird looked over, he says, hey coach, what's so funny? So I said, you'll never know, will you, Larry? And anyway, we lost in overtime. Oh, wow. The team pulled themselves together. You know, they were tight. They were feeling, they were feeling it. They were looking up at the at old things and Larry Bird and all this stuff. Well, we came roaring back and we played. And there was a time which, you know, it didn't take strategy. It took a, a, some reason to loosen up and to enjoy the game and have fun. And I had to remind our guys, we're in the NBA, too. They're not in here by themselves. And when they came out here, we beat them. Yeah, we had a guy on our team named Bristow who got in a fight with Larry Bird. They both got thrown out of the game. We ended up beating the Celtics up pretty good. <laughs> Great <Yeah>. strategy. <laughs> we didn't mean to do it, but that's the way it worked out. You know, one thing is, is that day, Larry Bird is a tough, tough guy. I have a lot of respect for him and everything. But he picked on the wrong guy. And Bristol was a tough guy, too. He wasn't known as, uh, as well as, as Larry Bird, though. He was a real career pro and, and had a great year with the Spurs, a great light, uh, career with the Spurs before he came with us and then played well with us. But he, he got into it toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They were throwing haymakers at each other. They both got thrown out, and we ended up beating the Celtics. That was the first time we beat him, and we beat him here. That's we, awesome. You know, you talk about toughness. 
And when you think toughness, of course, I think Coach Jerry Sloan, may he rest in peace. But I also think John Stockton. Give us some John Stockton stories and this, that toughness and that grit. Well, you know what? John Stockton was, was, was gifted because he had the feel that a lot of players, the hardest thing about going from college to, to the pros is knowing when to shoot and when to pass. And that's why when you look at the, at the pros right now, it's hard to pick out what you say is a true point guard, a true quarterback, somebody that wants to deliver the ball, get the ball to somebody at a certain time. You know, we used to, we used to say, we want to get two thirds inside to one third outside. We want to make sure that we want to get the ball to who we want, want to have it at a certain time. We want to say, what kind of shot? When are we going to shoot it? What kind of shot is it going to be? And who is going to shoot it? I mean, I want to, if I'm going down the wire, and especially in those days, I want the ball in the hands of Malone. I want and Adrian Dantley. You know, I don't want some other guy that, that, that can't make the shot or the odds are he's not going to make it. And I didn't know about this, what they do now about this actuality or something where they, they count how many shots you take and all oh, this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that the, that we, we knew where we wanted to go. We used to have a, a, something in which, you know, we, at the end of a game, we never would take an outside shot. We were going inside. We were going to get fouled or get a good percentage shot up. And, and of course, you got to have somebody that's able to deliver the ball and do that. And I can remember, you know, I can remember having drafted Stockton. We already had the all-star point guard uh, from the West was uh, Ricky Green. That's right. Paul. So we were having training camp down in St. George. And, and they was, we had our first scrimmage. And Ricky Green came out during a timeout. And I was coaching the, the, uh, the team that had uh, Ricky Green on it. And we had our second unit coached by, uh, by Jerry Sloan. And, and, and uh, uh, Ricky Green came up to me, he said, hey, coach, you got a good one in that, that, that kid over there. And of course, that kid was number 12, was the great John Stockton. Stockton made great decisions. And, and of course, when he, he was a good shooter. And, and when, he, you know, when he first came to us, he didn't have great range. You know? And now we had the three-point shot in and what have you. He went home and he paid kids to feed him. To get to, to shoot and shoot and work, he was willing to pay the price, and that's that that basically is what happens today. Is kids aren't willing to do that. We have you know people people. Uh, someone told me this, and and I and I believe it. Isn't it amazing at how many Asian girls are good in golf? And I asked somebody about that once. It says because they're willing to practice alone. They they have they're disciplined. And, and that's the kind of discipline that, uh, that John Stockton had. He went home and became better. Uh, he, could, he, he, he didn't uh, work on only those things he was good at. He went home and worked on those things he wasn't good at. And he made himself a perfect player. But he also had great vision. He had, he had a lot of, God gave him a lot of tools, all right? Uh, peripheral vision. He knew when to throw the ball hard, when to throw it soft. He had he had big hands, but he also was powerful. He had a good little build on, all right? He could set a vicious pick. That's and, you know, right. And, you know, a lot of big guys, you know, we'd cross underneath in our, in our uh, when we, uh, in our uh, transition game, and we had little guys uh, sometimes trying to cause mismatches. So we'd have a big, a little guys picking on big guys. And I had some, uh, some big guys say, Hey, the, the guy that throws the hardest pick in the league is, is John Stockton. He wasn't afraid to throw his body out there. And, you know, he, the other thing is he loved to play. Yeah. That is so important. He loved the game. He loved, you know, he just, he, he was there. He the first one in last one out. He loved to shoot. He loved to play. He loved after, after practice was over, he'd get a, get a guys together and play a little half court three against three with each other. He loved to compete. And uh, I think that's what made him unique. Yeah, he, he had, was. He had that old Irish toughness. His old there man you know, and his family were they they were bartenders and they were used to being slugging it out with people. But yeah, he uh, he he was he was tough. They played hurt, you know. And yeah, and there it, was no there was no load management back then because oh, he was the Cal Ripken of the NBA. <laughs> they played, and uh, you know Malone 
uh, you know, they, they loved to play. They played hard. I remember Carl Malone having a, a finger bent back. We were playing an exhibition game against the Spurs in, in New Mexico. And his finger was bent back. It was a mess. It was just terrible. They were talking about surgery and this and that. He pulled it back. All right, told the Sparky, our trainer, to tape it up. And he played in the second half. And when I asked him afterwards, I said, why did you take a chance of doing that? The doctor said you shouldn't go back and play. And he says, hey, a lot of people paid a lot of money to see me play. They may never have a chance to see me again here in New Mexico. He said, I wanted to give him everything I had. And it was an exhibition game. Yeah. Now, I'm not against yeah. load management. I'm not going to argue with that factor and everything else. What I do argue about is when people pay to see the Jazz or they pay to see the Lakers, they pay to see the whole team. They wanted to see Malone, Stockton, uh, Eaton, uh, you know, Bailey, whatever it was. And they also, they want to see uh, Magic Johnson and, and, and uh, you know, uh, Jabbar and, and Worthy and these guys. They, that's who they paid their money to see. So they get there and they find out, hey, two of these guys aren't playing because they're resting, you know. I said, this is at work. My, my father needed a rest on the docks. You know, yeah. he, needed, he needed time off. But uh, uh, yeah, we we have to be careful that we don't spoil our athletes mentally, you know, and that we don't we don't widen the gap that's already there between high school basketball and professional basketball. You know, it scares me to death if someone said, isn't it great? They are great shooters now. The athletes now, I'm not going to argue one bit. They, these these uh, these are the best athletes in the world, and they're playing the game at the highest level. The shooting is unbelievable. When I see uh, Del Curry, son, you know, oh, Del Curry, Steph, Del, yeah. Well, Del played for us, and he was a great shooter, a good shooter. But this guy is the greatest shooter I've ever seen in my life. But everybody can't shoot like him, and yet we still pump that ball up there. The three point, you know, we used to say you live by the jump shot, you die by it. It doesn't go in, and now we're doing it with the three-point shot. We're trying to catch up. We take a lot of a lot of bad shots are taken, even though the shooting percentage may be up there. It doesn't mean that there aren't bad shots taken at certain times in the game. I see teams virtually giving up by taking too many three-pointers at the end of the game, and uh, so we have to be careful of that. But Stockton had that balance. He knew who to get the ball to, when to get the ball to them. And and how to get it to them? He was he was wonderful. Yeah, you know, he was something, something he was, special. Yeah, he, and and he was a, he was a very talented player, very strong, had great endurance, took care of his body, and, and once he learned to uh, get his range, that, he didn't bring great range with him to the NBA, but he learned to be an outside shooter. He was an excellent three point shooter, made some great uh, important shots as we remember against Houston that time for the playoffs. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he was, he was special and tough and, and, and a, a real team player and was interested in winning. But let me tell you a great story about him. And this, the, then we'll move on is that on Sunday mornings, all right, my phone would ring, I pick it up and say, coach, we're meeting downstairs and go to mass. He would get all the Catholics on the team and march us off to, to mass on Sunday mornings when, when, it, to tell you the truth. After a game the night before and, and partying a little bit after it, it would have been more comfortable to stay in bed. But this is the kind of guy he was. He was a good Catholic gentleman, uh, a religious, and yet tough as nails. Yeah, I love, love hearing stories like that because a lot of people don't get to pull the curtain back and get to know them other than what they see from, from the stands. But I just yeah. love his toughness. <laughs> and sometimes we see that. And we get false, false impressions of who the people are. You know, uh, it, it's who you are all day long. You know, it's always, yes, sir. you know, if I, if I leave a guy in a room with a puppy, does he go and pet it? <laughs> there you go. I like that. I so, you know, you see, you see when kindness is needed, you know, then we find out who people are. Yeah, true. Okay. True testament to character. True yes. testament to character. That's well, right. let, let me ask you this, Coach. Back in the day when you just get moved here to, to Utah and you're you're in the Salt Palace, and of course they're they're pulling the rodeo in and out of there, and 
trying to get people to come to games. In your opinion, who was the most important piece to Utah basketball? Who Was it a player in the franchise? Was it your creativity, creating the old Indiana Jones <laughs> commercials or what, what was the what was the most fun and what was the most important part of, of building it here in Utah? When when I came here, I was with the I was with the uh, Atlanta Hawks as an assistant coach. I was doing a lot of traveling over into New Orleans to see the New Orleans Jazz, whose star at that time was the great Pete Maravich. Oh, pistol. One of the greatest players that ever lived. All right. Ever. And he loved the game and what have you, but he was hurt. He hurt his knee and he, he never recovered from it. Maybe today he would have, but he, he in those days, the, the, the operations weren't as, uh, as slick as they are now. But anyway, we came here and I'm going to, I'm going to mention a name. A lot of people in Utah will remember this name. A lot of people from the Mormon church will remember this name. But it was a, a, a gentleman by the name of Wendell Ashton. He was the publisher of the Deseret News. And he had a vision. He had a vision for, for Utah. He said, we are at the crossroads. Are we going to be Boise forever? Or are we going to be Dallas? Wow. Said, City of the future. Is this going to be the real Mecca for the, for the, uh, for the Mormon church? He said that we have to we have to build up the arts, we have to build up our sports, or what have you. And he had a vision of a of having a symphony hall, all right, at one end of the city, and at the other end a, a, a basketball arena in which we have professional basketball. And and they were hurt here by they had the championship team of the ABA, but the team folded because of lack of support financially and what have you. And the also. Stars. As we had, yeah, the, the, the famous stars, but we also didn't have an adequate uh, venue to play in. The Salt Palace was uh, one of the things when when the, the the Jazz were allowed to move the team here by Sam uh, Battistone, who was an absentee owner in terms that he lived in Santa Barbara. Uh, he, but he was a member of the church of the Mormon Church. Uh, uh, he uh, promised that sometime in the future we would look at building a new arena. Well, when the Lashen saw the idea of having at one end of the, of, of the spectrum, a beautiful uh, uh, arena to house uh, conferences, you know, uh, to, to be able to uh, bring in big, uh, big not, not necessarily church conferences, but business conferences and, and have people see how wonderful it is here with our mountains and the, the weather and, and the skiing and then the wonderful summers and everything else. And then at the other end, he wanted to have a big symphony hall where we could show off the arts. And, you know, we didn't have these things. The Saw Palace was, was, was not built for having professional sports at the number of games that were expected to play. It was good if you were gonna have the rodeo, something like that, a couple of events a year, but it certainly wasn't big enough or, or durable enough to have the, the events of, of a major league team day in and day out. So his vision was to get professional basketball back. And he got, he got Sam Battistone. He got the league to have the team coming back. He said they would get the support of the church, which we did, and then parking space and, and, and the promise of building a building or what have you. Well, eventually, of course, I would say Wendell Ashton had a lot to do with it. Of course, Sam Battistone, who brought the team here, put his money where his mouth was. Then we had a fellow come in here by the name of Dave Checkets. And Dave Checkets, who not only put a business uh, thing on it, you know, I, I, was, I was the general manager, but to tell you the truth, I was just interested in basketball. I wasn't selling tickets. Uh, I do all crazy stunts to try and, try and sell. You know, we had bat day here one time. We gave out bat, baseball bats. Of course, uh, baseball had done it. But anyway, we tried to have good, uh, a good relationship with the community, particularly the high schools, particularly we started junior jazz. And we had more kids playing, playing in the junior jazz, something like 110,000 five states wow. right around here, uh, playing junior jazz basketball. It became now the whole league is taking credit for 
and doing the same thing in the NBA. So we started Junior Jazz and, and we started this uh, idea of making the jazz part of the community, that we were Utah's team, not Salt Lake City's team, all right? And, and so anyway, Dave Checkers put a, a, a mod on it that was about business. And we had promotions and tickets and 100 Club and all these, all these things. So he had a lot to do with it. And, and I think that uh, then he got Larry Miller involved. Larry Miller came in and bought half the team. All right. And he had a Texas handshake with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Sam Battistone. That meant if either one of them wanted to sell, the other one could buy the rest of the team from them before they made it public. And there were times when we, I thought seriously, we were out of here. We'd be headed for Minnesota or Vancouver or wherever it was, Toronto. But instead, uh, we always managed to hold on. Uh, Larry infused enthusiasm and he infused money into it, the Miller family, and they put up a lot of money and then he committed to the building. And once he did that, that solidified who the jazz were. We not just built a building, we built the best building one of the best venues in the whole league. And, uh, and, uh, and it was, it was, uh, it was big enough. It was strong enough. It was, it was, it was enough. As I say strong enough, in other words, to sell this community and the whole country on basketball. And then we had the all-star game here. We had the finals here. All right. All of those things helped to solidify who the team was. Now, who else? We had Battistone, Miller, all right, check it. Uh, I, I mentioned before uh, uh, Wendell Ashton, who was the he was the driving force, I think, that kept us here and never gets mentioned, never gets his name mentioned. But if it wasn't for him, there'd be no jazz. Wow. He, got away. he went to New York. He talked to David Stern, convincing him that that they would we would able to sell tickets and and but move the team forward. All right. And then came Jerry Sloan. First, as, as a, an assistant who had lost his job at, as, as a coach, uh, had a great reputation as a tough guy, as a player, what have you, got the coaching job with the Bulls, uh, didn't have a very good team, lost the job, and then came back here as first as a scout for us, and then as an assistant coach, and eventually coach. So he was the next person who stepped up and really uh, made this team a contender. And once we had you know, we had shown that we could handle the playoffs, uh, even to the finals. The whole world saw us on TV. And then we saw the, the all-star game here. I think we were off and running. And this became from not just a, another franchise, small franchise, but a model. Believe it or not, we got calls from the Pittsburgh Steelers to have people have us go there and talk to them about the operation. We got the call from the Dodgers, all right? And, and we went down there. I remember, remember one thing about the Dodgers. They, they taught me a lesson and said, when you get good people, keep them. Everybody in the Dodger front office was gray, had gray hair. Because they had good people. They worked there when they were young. They stayed with them. And we did the same thing here. We had so many people. You know, uh, Helen Danes, I mentioned, was, was a little lady who, Worked as the head secretary here, Judy Adams. I mean, there were so many people. I won't name to hurt somebody's feelings, but we had we had people who came here and worked the rest of their lives with us, and and just uh, brought such character and and uh, enthusiasm and loved the jazz. Yeah, loved the jazz. not about money, but because the jazz were a family, and uh, and it it worked out that way. So those are a few of the names. Oh, uh, just wonderful. No, no organization is built on, you know, you can say, you know, what saved the Yankees? Babe Ruth, of course, he had a lot to do with it. But then it was, you know, now when you look back on, on what, what has been the last 50 years is the Steinbrenners or what the Yankees are about, you know. So true. So true. I'll tell you what, we're going to continue this conversation because we're having so much fun. But we'll call that part one. And we'll continue on with part two. Bring it in. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DVNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production. 
Don't forget to subscribe to The Coach's YouTube channel. Like and follow him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have yourself dressed and ready to go in the locker room for the next exciting show coming soon. Thank you for watching The Coach Scott Fields Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DBNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production.